Welcome to the Nichols Tax Update Podcast, Issue 2141. Here's the regular disclaimer. I want to read the third paragraph. I acknowledge the value in preparation of this program of my subscription to Tax and Notes today. Published by Tax Analysts, in my opinion, Tax Analysts is the preeminent provider of information about federal tax law out of Washington, D.C. Usually in this program, we talk only about federal tax law, but today we're also going to talk a little bit about state tax law. The South Carolina remote seller rules are interesting as they interact with other states' remote seller rules. And then the IRS has denied exempt status, 501c3 status, to a social recreational organization that believes they should have had that. We'll talk about why not. Then the IRS confirms a deadline for any partner in a BBA partnership. That's going to be a partnership with a whole lot of partners that did not elect out of the, the new partnership audit regime. The deadline for you to, to file your push-out statement. We'll talk about what it is and what it does. Then we have a practice unit that covers the reseller's Unicap, their 263 Cap A calculation, but it really only applies to a reseller with more than $26 million in average annual gross receipts. Then a partner must report and pay income tax on their distributive share of partnership section 1231 gain reported to them on their Schedule K-1. I think most of us know that. This lady didn't know that. She litigated vigorously and ultimately was defeated twice. Finally, IRS systems are broken. I knew that. You knew that. Both the revenue collection and taxpayer service are suffering as a result. I knew that. You knew that. What can be done about it? I'm not sure. But I do know that some of our professional organizations are attempting to get the attention of lawmakers. So those are our topics. Let's go to work. <laughs> I was able to find a picture of a peddler selling stuff out of a wagon. Now, the old time peddler didn't pay much attention to state boundaries. He went from place to place and he sold the stuff out of his wagon. And from time to time, he'd re re restore the wagon. It didn't matter where he was when he sold his stuff. But today that matters. Remote sellers and marketplace facilitators are subject to income tax and their transactions are subject to state sales tax in South Carolina. Once you have to register, you're going to be subject to income tax in the state along with the sales tax. When the volume of transactions exceeds a statutory limit in South Carolina of $100,000 a year. North Carolina and Georgia have that same dollar limit but they have an alternative of 200 separate transactions. If I sell things for $5 a piece and I sell 202 of them into, your, into North Carolina or Georgia, I'm subject to collecting the sales tax and probably filing an income tax return. I didn't really check out those rules as carefully as the sales tax rules. You can do that if you have the problem. Tennessee's rule follows South Carolina. The rules in New York and California, as you might imagine, are, are <laughs> bigger because they have more uh, opportunity for volume. Uh, if you sell more than $500,000 worth of stuff into either New York or California, you're going to file in either one of those states. So most of the 47 states, however, I think the modal limit is $100,000. A few of them also impose 200 or 250 separate transactions. So far, only Alaska, Montana, and Oregon have resisted the temptation to enhance their revenue by taxing in-state sales by out-of-state resellers. Next, if the picture doesn't tell the story, you'll get the idea that the organization that sought 501c3 status here was somehow associated with or was interested in the uh, lesbian, bisexual, gay, transsexual, queer, I think LBGTQ movement. And that's exactly what they had in mind. They filed their application for exempt status 
on a Form 1023-EZ. And they carefully described the events they planned, but it looked like they were a social and recreational organization. They wanted to provide a place where like-minded people could get together without fear of, of, uh, of anyone looking down on them or, or thinking less of them, or they could enjoy each other socially. Uh, and that was denied. The problem was that's not a charitable undertaking. They, this organization would clearly have, have qualified for a 501c7, but that would require an application on a Form 1024. And everything, well, that's everything else except a 501c4. The 501c4 goes on a 1024a. Why, why, does, it, why does this happen this way? Well, because the 1023EZ is so seductively simple and three or four of us are sitting around and we're, we're having a drink or we're having a smoke and this really sounds like a really good idea. Let's apply for exempt status. And all anybody in that group knows about is exempt status. They don't understand the difference between a 501c3 and a 501c4 and a 501c7 and a c6 and a c5. They, they grab the EZ and they apply and, and we have this confusion. So if you are associated with any kind of an application for exempt status, make sure you use the right form, make sure you counsel the client that is a prospective tax exempt organization as to the kind of exempt organization they can be. You can't be a 501c3, which allows you to uh, or allows the, your contributors to claim a tax deduction for the money they give you if you're not undertaking charitable or educational activities. Pretty straightforward, but we continue to have people that make that mistake. I think they get frustrated, and this is a place where people don't know the law, they, 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 they don't think about it, uh, and so they get confused and, and sometimes frustrated. Speaking of frustration, <laughs> The Form 8986 is filed after a partnership prepares an, uh, a Form 8985. This is the push-out form. This is the partner share of adjustments to partnership-related items that is required to be provided by New Code Sections 6226 and 6227. Following an audit of a partnership subject to the bipartisan, I'm, I'm sorry, to the a BBA, the, yeah, the Bipartisan Budget Act, Centralized Partnership Audit Regime, the IRS is going to propose adjustments to partnership income and, and other partnership transactions. If the partnership agrees to those, they'll complete a Form 8985 and they will prepare a Form 8986 to push out the adjustments to the partners so the partners will pay the tax on the adjustments that were not the adjustments that are made in the partnership audit. That's because that might change things other than the partner's outside basis. And it might change things for which the partner has some sort of um, liability in the future. So the partnership provides the form 8986. That's the push out form that's required. Here's what the form looks like. Uh, and by the way, that's page one of, I, I believe, four pages. It's a very complex form. It reports all the all the things that are changed in an IRS audit. It can report a change in the income. It can report a change in the basis of assets. It can report a change in capital accounts. It can report a change in, in uh, virtually any aspect of partnership taxation and transactions between the partnership and partners. And so this new partnership audit regime applies to larger partnerships, partners with partnerships that have more than five, more than ten, more than more than ten partners, and if you're a small partnership, you're not subject 
to the BVA. And if you're if you are, I guess all partnerships are one way or another, you, you opt out. And if you opt out, then you don't have to to appoint a partnership representative and you're not subject to these BBA audit rules. So where this is going to hit is the CPA whose client is a large partnership, partnership with 100 partners that does not opt out and you have an audit. You're going to you're going to prepare a form 8985 for the partnership itself and you're going to prepare forms 8986 to provide to each partner. Well, here are two ladies having a good time in a retail store. I'd be willing to bet that that retail store has average annual gross sales in excess of 26 million adjusted for inflation. So these ladies are buying clothes and they're having a good time, but the reseller has to calculate their inventory using the unit cap rules of 263 cap A. The best place to find out how the IRS expects that we're doing that is their audit guide. Now, this practice unit explains how an IRS agent is supposed to audit the taxpayer's 263A accumulation of costs. If I know how they're going to audit the accumulation of costs, then I know how to accumulate costs. It's like having the other team's playbook. This is a practice unit. We talk about these every time they're published. We want, we want practitioners to know about them. We can use them. They're free. They're slideshows that are prepared to train IRS agents. If they can train an IRS agent with this material, then I can train accountants in my firm with this material. It doesn't cost any extra. I don't have to pay anybody to go to a CPE program. I can use this material for free, and you should. Next, partnership income must be reported. I thought everyone knew that. And I think maybe Taryn Dodd knew that. She'd been up to tax court once already, and her case was sent back to, to appeals on a technicality. And it, appeals cleared the technicality and sent her back. Well, they... they explained to her that she had to pay the tax. She didn't like the second answer any more than she liked the first, and so she's back in tax court. They're clearly not happy about that. The tax court judge who wrote this memo decision, this is written by one judge, is clearly not happy that this lady is back. She's a partner in a real estate partnership. She signed all the documents for the partnership. The partnership sold a building. There was a recapture of depreciation, phantom income, right? But it was reported to her on a K-1, and looking at the numbers from the K-1, it's pretty clear she got a distribution of just over $200,000. And her the income that's, that's in dispute here is a, a, just a little over a million. So she got the cash to pay the tax, but didn't believe she should be taxed on money she did not get. The money was not distributed to her. The money was in fact used to pay one of her obligations. She co-signed for an obligation and the money from closing out this building went to pay off that obligation in, 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 because they had an agreement with the bank. She didn't get the money, but she got the benefit of the money. That's the same as, and she has to pay the tax. Internal Revenue Code Section 702A is clear as a bell. The U.S. Supreme Court said so in 1973 in the Basie, B-A-S-Y-E decision. You don't believe me? Look it up. The IRS systems are broken. Tell me something I didn't know. The IRS agent with his briefcase to collect tax is, is a hollow line drawing of what he used to be. They don't have the tools. They don't have the information. We're all wasting a lot of each other's time. The complexities of turnover, analysis, taxation, solution, meeting, customer, partners, seminar, process, strategy. <laughs> the system is broken. It's We are all overwhelmed. I talk to practitioners all the time that are on the firing line, that call and wait. They sit on hold 
for 70 minutes, 80 minutes, for, for two hours. They finally get to talk to a live person and in the process of the conversation, they're put on hold and immediately cut off. That's not right. Here's a letter from the National Association of Enrolled Agents. Millions of tax returns, some as much as two years old, have still not even been opened. They're not processed into the system, but the IRS is continuing to turn its computers loose to send computer generated notices. So my client gets a computer generated notice, thinks I haven't done my job, calls up, I write, I, I spend the time to write a letter or try to make a phone call, try to fix it, send the client a copy of the letter. I can't charge for the time. I'm sure you can't either, right? And so we're all negatively impacted by, I'll tell you what it is, our elected representatives don't like the IRS because a lot of them don't really pay tax on all their income. They get caught in IRS audits. They don't want to be audited. They're protecting themselves. And audit statistics bear that out. I'm not blowing smoke. I'm telling you the truth that, the, that we have members of Congress who are delinquent in their taxes for more than a year and are avoiding collection by taking advantage of their position. They don't want to fund the IRS. You do. I do. We need to make our voices heard. And the sooner the better. Thank you for joining me every week. Thank you for supporting this little information uh, device, uh, sharing device. I appreciate all of you. Stay safe. We need each other to get through this.